Okay, I've graded your first position papers. Excellent jobs. Um, I was very impressed with several of them. Remember to make sure that in your <clears throat> arguments discussion, to make sure that you connect the qualities of a particular item in respects to the vertical integration that's going to be uh, important for you if you haven't done them. Thursday, I will not be here, but I will record a session for what you'll be responsible for. So watch online and you'll see the Zoom recording of it. To, on Thursday, I'll be at the uh, SMA conference. Uh, I'm going to be on a panel and we're going to be talking about the future of cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens and where we see them going in the next decade or so. So as I said, I will not be here but there will be a recording online and you will be responsible for it, okay? So without further ado, let us go right ahead and we will start talking about wholesaling. <laughs> If any of you get the possibility of working for a wholesaler, I'm all in favor. Um, the interesting thing is that wholesaling seems to fly under the radar and that wholesaling as a general um, kind of thought has gone through an amazing history over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, even though it's gone through a wave of consolidation, the same number of individuals in wholesaling has remained consistent. So it hasn't been a the purpose or reason to reduce the number of employees, but actually through efficiencies that have been created. That's why we have fewer wholesalers. So what are the key qualities that wholesalers possess? All right. So if I say wholesaler and I say distributor, I am in essence talking about the same thing. So if you see on a test where it says distributor or it says wholesaler, I don't know why Palmentier did this, but they kind of mix together and it sometimes can make it a little bit confusing. But I want you to understand that there is a difference. Distributors used to be uh, in a more traditional sense, a manufacturer who distributed, but we don't go through that anymore. So just think of them at the same time. So what is the key quality about a wholesaler? Wholesalers are independently owned, operated firms that buy and sell products. This last five words are the ones that are the important ones. Over which they claim ownership. Over which they claim ownership. Why is that so significant? So think about the properties of distribution, one of them being property, okay, in other words, physical possession, and the other being ownership. And it will make it will make a little bit more sense to you. All right. The big thing about claiming ownership is they have the right. <laughs> set prices. Sure. 
they have the right to set prices. Title and ownership means that the wholesalers own them and the manufacturers have very little to do or say about how to use them or to effectively sell them. It is also important to understand that just like retailing firms, wholesalers do something very valuable in that they consolidate unique products or like ones and put them under a unique umbrella and can, can find very unique, specific things in which those products can be sold for. So what is the purpose or why do wholesalers, or why are they so valuable? All right. They add value. By adding service. They are, in essence, the epitome of service. And that seems kind of strange. Wholesalers, you would think, that would just simply transfer the good from one sector to another. But the actual truth is, is not. Wholesalers, in many ways, are even more important when it comes to service, especially for retailers who desire to have some single body of knowledge in which to draw from. Wholesalers are enormously valuable. They're going to be around, as, as far as I know, to perpetuity, because quite simply, the things that they do are very important and can't be replicated. Now, the interesting thing about it is, that I said before, is that for the last 40 or 50 years, they have been subject to a massive wave of consolidation, industry by industry. A lot of that has been sparked mostly by IT. IT brings enormous competitive advantages to wholesaling such because of the massive numbers that wholesalers attract the economies of scale are just a natural play. <laughs> but wholesaling can maximize the power of economies of scales in ways that anyone else. We've had a disappearance of around two thirds of the wholesalers in the United States. But as I said before, the number of people employed in, whole, in wholesaling hasn't changed. And one of the major reasons why we'll talk about this later is quite simply is wholesaling is one of the most labor intensive of all of it. it retailing, wholesaling, they are very labor intensive. Trucking is certainly another part of that. Trucking is the largest employer in the United States in a given industry. It just is a very heavy duty labor intensive kind of job. We have seen in the last 50 years, the rise of something that was also now called the master distributor. The master distributor. So what is the master, master distributor? We have we have retailers we have distributors and then we have another category that are known as the master distributors that actually sell to distributors and retailers at the same time, excuse me. Yeah. 
Master distributors are unique because what they will do is they will consolidate products that might be considered generic in nature or built for a particular purpose and through some kind of specialized industrial intelligence can use them in some unique other way. And so let me give you an example of this. <clears throat> I used to work at Morgan City for a company called Oilfield Warehouse and Port Hardware. Oilfield Warehouse and Port Hardware um, are <clears throat> distributors to corporations such as Sh uh, Shell Oil, Kermagee, many of those other kinds of locations. We specialized in high pressure hoses. We specialized in, in uh, industrial suits, many other different things like that. Um, Port Hardware was the other side of it, which did generic hardware goods that were needed for corporations such as Kermagee and Shell and Exxon and all of those other corporations as well. We got the contract for Kermagee for stainless steel tubing. Now, it may not seem, you know, in, amazing to you, but stainless steel tubing is extremely valuable, especially when you're talking about working offshore and the corrosive aspects of salt. Um, steel, a ton of steel fully oxidized becomes three tons of steel. Um, it very easily in, in interaction with salt corrodes itself very quickly. Stainless steel is the only way to build piping and tubing for, uh, for uses offshore. But if anybody has ever tried to price out stainless steel, it's ridiculously, enormously expensive. A single quarter inch foot, it, um, a quarter inch tubing is somewhere around 45 to $50. Now think about it when you're building an oil rig where there are miles <laughs> of stainless steel tubing on a given oil rig. Um, not only that, but the oil rigs are actually rented. They're not bought. The interesting thing about when it comes to Exxon and Chevron and all of the others is they don't own a single production platform. They rent them from corporations like Harima and Halliburton and all of those others. And so it's, it's a very unique situation the way it works. However, if I got a call from Kermagee for 40,000 feet of stainless steel tubing, it is beyond the ability of my little corporation or our corporation to be able to, to handle that. Not only that, but our sales port hardware, Morgan City Hardware, uh, I can't remember the other one that was there in the 80s. Um, anyway, none of us could consolidate and possibly be able to do that. But we had another company that would help us, a company of very big shoulders and a master distributor known as Moody Price. Moody Price is a distributor that started out in one little office in Homer, Louisiana. Um, they rapidly grew to have one in Houston. Now they're all the way across the Southeast. They have 11 locations, over 100 employees. And one of the things that they do as a master distributor, which makes it unique is they take these unlike brands, all of these brands that have products that are used for entirely different applications and through their own expertise and knowledge, specializing in oil field use. Just to give you an idea, um, oil filters, just, just in, in, in terms of that, diesel, diesel engines, which is what all of the generators that are made are used, basically are used in thousands of hours. And every three days, three and a half days, the filters on these diesel engines must be changed. Diesel, by the way, is the very last part of the fuel when you refine oil. Diesel is what is left. It is all the dregs and everything else that, that can't be used. Well, Rudolph Diesel, which is the man where the name came from, 
came up with an engine that could actually burn this stuff. But the difficulty is it's, it's very impure and requires constant filtering. Just think about a filter about this size, about that big around, costing anywhere for about $200. So think if you're going to have a thousand of those on the rig, kind of gives you an idea of just how expensive they can be. Um, even certain things like Teflon tape, which you absolutely must have if you're piping helium, because helium is extremely slippery as an idea. All of these are things that in one way or another may have some other functional use in other, in other industries, but under Moody Price and their expertise, they're able to take all of these particular items and create a commonality around their use in heavy industrial and oil field use. And that's the value that Moody Price brings. They took the contract away from us and went directly to Moody Price. We couldn't do anything about that, but Moody, brought, Moody Price at least let us do the fittings. Now, along with all of the things that Moody Price sells, Moody Price sells knowledge. And this is probably the most important thing they did. As I said, as a wholesaler, they are the epitome of service. And not only do they sell their knowledge to the oil they sell their knowledge to us. We got our certification in high pressure hoses from Moody Price, and we were able to pass that around. So just to give you an idea, these are some of the services that Moody Price does. They give you classroom training on very specialized things like how do you make fitting and install high pressure uh, hoses, how you uh, properly repair equipment. They also have a rental section. And if you've ever tried to fit pipe or ever tried to thread pipe, the pipe threaders can cost hundreds to even thousands of dollars. Can you imagine trying to pay for a pipe threader that's that expensive that you might use once. Well, that's what a company like Moody Price does. You know, they do more than just simply, our master distributors do more than just simply buy goods low and sell them high. They create value in everything and every transaction that they make. And they, their knowledge, the experience, and technical ability is always there for us as a retailer to be able to call on when we're just not sure. And so this is the value of a master distributor and what they can ultimately do when it comes to helping us as a business. And so there are distributors and there are master distributors and that is where they set their, their stakes. Master distributors create a stable, prosperous system. They create a place where manufacturers can come, bring their equipment, and be judged as to whether or not it's suitable for their particular industry. Not only that, they can do the jobs that manufacturers can't many times even more efficiently than the manufacturers themselves because they have their boots on the ground and they know what's going on in each particular industry. They consolidate orders from all the manufacturers. It allows me as a corporation to try to report hardware and oil field warehouse. It avoided me the disaster of trying to get together the money to buy 10,000, 20,000 feet of stainless steel tubing. It allowed them to consolidate my orders, Port Hard, excuse me, Morgan City Hardware's orders, all of our orders together and meet the minimum requirements established by the manufacturers, they become our brokers.
they also become our secondary warehouses as well. Moody Price had no problem if we had an order. I mean, where do you stack 40,000 feet of stainless steel tubing in a safe place? Think about it when it's $40 a foot, it it, it kind of makes it stealable, okay? And, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, when they're cutting catalytic converters off of cars, you can imagine what the temptation of a million dollar order of stainless steel would be. And not only that, stainless steel is malleable, it'd be very easy to change it, okay? And so the master distributors have the economies of scale and scope. They can revolve a lot, resolve a lot of logistic problems. They can work as a mutual partner with my corporation. And ultimately we have a win-win situation. Now, along with distributors, wholesalers, and master distributors, mm -hmm. there are other participants in the supply chain. In the brave world of wholesaling, you have many different places in which you can be successful. Because of the enormous amount of money involved, and because of the difficulties, especially with logistics, when you're talking about the massive scale we're thinking of, distributors and wholesalers are ripe for agents, brokers, and commissions agents. Anybody in here real estate? In real estate? Okay. <laughs> Real estate and brokers are very much the same thing. Brokers are salespeople, excuse me, agents are salespeople who don't actually have title of the goods that they're selling. If I'm a real estate agent and I have a dozen properties, those dozen properties, don't, I don't own them, all right? They, they are in the hands of the individuals who own those pieces of property. But what my job is to do is to learn what those properties are and be able to sell them in the best way that we possibly can. So when we were ready to sell our house and move to University Circle, um, an opening came up. Um, we happened to have a real estate agent in that area. Her last name was McCracken, Dr. McCracken's wife. And boy, you talk about an expert. Someone as a marketing person kind of standing back, watching the way she did her job. I was so impressed. You know, by the time she got finished with our house, you know, setting it up and, and showrooming it and all like that, I wanted to move back in. Um, but we went on to a better place. Uh, agents are worth their way of doing gold. Broke, okay, agents represent only one side of the transaction, okay? They represent only one side, <coughs> the seller. Brokers are individuals who represent or try to help both sides of the transaction. A broker is a specialized agent, usually a really good one, in a unique industry. And the purpose of a broker is to bring a buyer and a seller together. And so there are some outstanding brokers right now that are doing amazing things like keeping this mall alive, which I'm very impressed with. They, they just got somebody else to come in. Uh, malls are dying all over the United <coughs> States. But the interesting thing is that the medium-sized mall still has some life left in it. And it's kind of nice to see. But how do they do it? Well, they don't own the property. They take on the property as a client, and then they act as a as someone who goes out and solicits the business. They get the buyer and the seller together. They negotiate the transaction. They get the handshake deal done, 
and then they collect usually about 15% of the broker's fee. The amazing thing about brokers is they make no salary whatsoever. The money that they make usually comes on 15% of the net profit. And if you think that's a bad way to go, folks, the most successful and highest paid salespeople in the world are people who have no salary. They work strictly on commission. My, uh, my nephew, uh, my, my niece, Rachel, who's just an amazing person. I'm just so amazed with Rachel. She has, she has four children. She runs her own business. She teaches children cooking. Now, is that really cool? She teaches cooking classes in the summer. She teaches kids how to make bread, the proper ways of using sugar and salt and little things that my, our grandmothers would have taught us. She teaches them now and, and her, her, her uh, classes are packed. Her husband is a commissioned agent and he's a seven figure salary guy. And he is a natural for it. But the best, if you're the best salesperson there is folks, you're gonna be a commission. So I've talked about third-party logistics providers and I'm gonna talk about them again. Third-party logistics providers are specialized intermediaries who have one unique service and for that activity, they have a fee. Whatever their activity is, they are paid for. So an, ex an example, and I'm going to go back to my discussion is Is what's known as a hot shot. So, what is a hot shot? And if, so I talked about those production platforms and the drilling platform. By the way, a drilling platform is where they're actively looking for oil. A production platform is where oil has been found and they're pumping. Okay, so they rent these places for four hundred thousand dollars to eight hundred thousand dollars a day. The highly the most expensive ones are drilling ships in which you can drill up to a mile and a half, two miles out in the ocean. They're about a million dollars a day. So imagine what would happen if they broke something on those rigs and they broke something and they could not fix it. Just think of the money that is wasted every single second. Well, in the 60s, you have the emergence of what was known as the hotshot. And so what the hotshot does is as soon as something is needed, the hotshotter gets in their truck and does whatever it takes to get to a particular either a helicopter platform or to a, sh a boat or a ship to get that to the rig as quickly as it possibly can. Tickets notwithstanding. Um, their wheels don't touch the ground. They've got to get where they're going. I know a hot shotter that went from Morgan City to Homa in about 45 minutes, and it's about 65 miles away on a two-lane highway. I don't want to know how he did it. All right? But this is an example of a third-party logistics provider. They're providing unique specialized service that in many ways is invaluable and that they can be called on 24 hours a day you can call them up 3 a.m. in the morning, and they're going to go out and get that good to you as quickly as they possibly can. Of course, we started out in the original half-ton pickup trucks, and now they've moved to the larger and everything, mm -hmm. even up in, including airlines now. So third-party logistics providers, they, <laughs> they don't take title, but they do take possession, and they do whatever they can to be able to get the good where it needs to go. So what do 
wholesalers try to do? What are the challenges that wholesalers have? There are three great challenges in wholesaling. And yes, this is a test question. Because it's very easy to underestimate all the challenges and the difficulties in being a wholesaler. The challenges are invisible to the buyers, but they are absolutely critical. There are three great challenges and they remain the same. The first is to do the job correctly with no errors. The second is to do the job effectively. And by maximum service, what that means is to provide the maximum value to the customer. And the third is to do the job efficiently, which means the lowest cost. And so what we have in this situation is we have three great things pulling at us, right? We have the reduction of errors. <coughs> the top of service, and then the lowest of costs. Those three great things. You can very easily quite see that they don't relate to each other. If I'm going to provide the maximum service, I've got to do it where there are no errors at the minimum cost possible. We're setting up an analytics summit in, in April. And one of the things that we need to do, and it doesn't sound much, but we need to be able to cater this thing to the maximum enjoyment of the people that are going to go. It's very, very hard on you when you create a day long situation, an environment that is rewarding and educational, and yet the only thing people remember is they ran out of coffee at 9 a.m., or it took 45 minutes to serve the food. And so those are the things I worry about because I'm a marketer, all right? And, and to me, that, that all comes under those kind of headings. Nobody in there appreciated it, I, I don't think, like I do because I know that those are the things we'll be judged on the, the worst, okay? So these are the three great challenges. Do the job correctly, do, do the job effectively, and do the job efficiently. Now, to give you an idea of what's happened to wholesaling in general, let's do this kind of discussion about where wholesaling was in the pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceuticals, the wholesalers in the United States have had kind of a very eclectic history, like a lot of things are, realizes that in the United States, we were not producing pharmaceuticals or medications, maybe up until the mid 19th century, maybe early 19th century. So how did physicians in the United States, how did they get the medications that they had? Well, what they would do is they would do it this way. Um, a band of doctors would get together and they would have one doctor, they would call the, him, that individual, the buyer. And so the buyer would collect all of the orders from those doctors together. And that one doctor would sail to Europe, usually to Great Britain or England, excuse me. That one individual would buy all the pharmaceuticals that he could. He would come back with those and he would distribute the pharmaceuticals to his related doctors. Realize this, we're also talking about a time when it was 60 to 90 sailing days to England 
So it was theoretically possible that it would take nearly half a year before those goods would get to the United States. Sailing was just as efficient as sending a letter. So that's what you did. Now, wasn't into the 19th century that you started to see what we would consider to be traditional pharmacies. And it's also important to note that the pharmacies were created as businesses that were independent of physicians. And so pharmacy, pharmacies started becoming businesses run independently than doctors themselves. <laughs> Usually drug wholesalers operated in a local way and very much in stiff competition with each other. Once again, we're not talking about a structure where you had the vast reach that we have today. One thing I also want you to remember is pharmaceuticals is an enormously labor intensive process even to this day if we think about picking. Just think about just think about any prescription that you're having today and realize at one time it took one individual with a pencil because you did not put your fingers on the pharmaceuticals and counting them one at a time to make sure that all of those goods went into each individual bottle. And think of the millions and millions of prescriptions that are run every day in the United States now. Around the middle of the 19th century, pharmacies also started, <clears throat> excuse me, started doing things like beauty products as well. And so pharmaceuticals went past just the simple drugs and they started doing beauty products. They started doing holistic medicines. You started to see them once again because there were locations where you had goods, you started to see them spread in the number of things that they started to, to cover. The wholesalings grew to be able to cover those groups out there. They grew larger and larger and larger. And, but eventually what you found is that from 78 to 96, that the number of wholesalers in the United States dropped from 147 to 53. And now we're down to five, I think, or maybe even four at this time. And they account for over three quarters of all of the national market now. Now, the first question you might ask is what took them so long? You would think that by 96, they should have had a lot of this stuff kind of figured out. Well, yes and no, they figured it out, but they didn't have the structure sufficient enough to be able to take care of the advantages. Because as I said before, there's an enormous amount of picking that goes on in doing that work, all right? There's an, they have to gather the products together. They have to gather that information on who needs to have what go where. And you had to have an efficient structure to be able to exploit the economies of scale and also have the ability to absorb risk. That was the other thing that Moody Price did for us, quite simply, for us to spend $100,000 is like rolling the dice on one great try. But Moody Price could do those things for us and their profit came from absorbing the risk that we didn't have to. The pharmaceutical wholesaler industry was able to consolidate also the number of buyers that they had to deal with as well. And so the wholesalers did two things. When three or four wholesalers got together, they looked at the entire number of distributors, or excuse me, of the number of manufacturers they had, and they started looking for redundancies and they eliminated the redundancies. This also dropped the price of pharmaceuticals as well. And it also made it much more advantageous. They were able to filter goods also into appropriate categories, be able to state which are drugs, which are health aids, which are beauty aids. They assembled everything into a sense of order. 
they transform their goods into categories and like ones and allowed retailers to be much more efficient in the goods that they sold. Wholesalers can also do things like take goods that they buy and bring it almost to the final product and allow retailers to put their own personal touch on it. So an example of this. Um, so I talked about when I worked for Omni Computer Store in Lafayette, and we decided we were going to get rid of uh, Hewlett Packard. But at that time, we were trying to come up with an idea of were well, we going to sell another manufacturer's brand or not. Well, there were distributors in Houston that would do something that's called kitting. So anybody ever build their own PC? Okay, don't do it. You still do it? Really cool. What kind, I'm just kind of curious. What kind of motherboards are okay? Okay, it's kind of cool, isn't it? You know, you're building your own stuff. It's kind of what we used to do when I was, you know, in my 20s. We didn't hot rod. We built machines. So that was kind of our kind of thing. We started using manufacturers like Asus, um, many other manufacturers. Direct uh, Direct X became big at that time. A lot of the other manufacturers because what what a company would do in Houston for us is they would put the motherboard in the machine. They would take the hard drive and put, put it in the machine as well. They would do a burn test on it to make sure all of the products would work. And then they would send it to us and we would put our own operating system on it, slap on our own decal and we've got a machine and it worked great. Um, it allowed us to have like a 15% margin but it also meant that we didn't have to spend those 200 burn-in hours trying to make this machine, and, and it can be a pain. But they could do 200 machines at a time in their factory, and we didn't have to do it as well. So that's what a wholesaler can do. A wholesaler can bundle those activities together that we can't do in an economic way and allow us to sell that at a profit. It worked. <laughs> Benny, he named him the Cajun PC. I went off. Come on, Benny. Um, but anyway, he was the owner. I was just the uh, manager. It worked out. So, so anyway, they can customize for you. They can put together your order all the way to the final step and let you do the rest. They can kit those things together. Um, they can they can suggest what is appropriate for our situation. They do did all of those things for us. And they created value for us that we simply couldn't do for ourselves. And so that's one of the things that that wholesalers do. They gather, they process the information, they create the products for us, they create the economy to scale, they absorb the risks for us, and they transform the goods into something that was more valuable to us than we could have done for ourselves. All of these are things that wholesalers do. Now, the difficulty, I will say this, and this will probably be like one or two questions, is unfortunately, wholesalers also have a bad reputation as well, especially in emerging markets. In emerging markets, they do not have the institutional trust that is required. And so Niger in Africa was an example. It is one of the bread baskets of the world when it comes to farming. And it would be much to their advantage if they were to come under some wholesaling kind of environment. But unfortunately, the organizational memory, the institutional memory of colonialism is quite simply one that is very difficult for them to overcome. <clears throat> and the best way to make a Niger farmer succeed is to be able to promote and help a Niger wholesaler. And that I also should say that is also a genuine benefit that most wholesalers should have. That's an important point. Wholesalers generally 
are best or more efficient when they dedicate themselves to the geographical area in which they originate. It sounds silly, but retailing tends to be international, but wholesaling tends to be regional. When we, when we looked about Tesla, I was very impressed um, with many of you uh, when you were talking about uh, Tesla and you were talking about the vertical integration that Tesla did. And I think very much goes so in the fact that is the wholesaling history tends to be one towards structures that are horizontal in nature. And in essence, what Tesla had to do was create their own, they create their own um, market and they did a very successful. <laughs> now here's the problem though, is that if I'm gonna be a wholesaler, wholesalers are generally in a form of consolidation. Consolidation tends to be the future in wholesale. And the pressure is always going to be there because wholesalers are naturals when it comes to the economies of scale. The more that a wholesaler grows, the more efficient they become, the higher profits that they have, the more sophisticated they become. I like the board, okay? They get better as they get more. And so if I'm a wholesaler, I have to be in my own mind always looking at the fact that eventually I may be absorbed, I can't help it. And so the important thing for me as a wholesaler is to try to figure out if I'm going to sell myself, who to sell to. So when I was selling my internet service providership, I had two or three suitors. And two of them were actually, one of them was number one and one of them was number two. So what are the four basic types when it comes to consolidation? The first are the catalyst firms, the ones that are out there triggering consolidation by inquiring as much or as many organizations as they can. I've noticed, although not in the same shape, I've noticed this uh, GM dealer out here, um, out on 421 has gone through three or four um, ownerships in like the last five or six years. And I think a lot of this is the two of these guys that I've talked to them, um, we're in this consolidation wave that we're trying to build up massively or as quickly as possible to be able to generate the economies of scale as quickly as they could. The next is the ones that enter late after consolidation has happened. They've survived, they're strong, and they're coming in and mopping up all the little ones. When I started an ISP, there were like 4,000 of us in the United States, 4,500, there weren't that many. Um, and they were mostly folks like me. I mean, you know, they had an idea, they were fascinated with the internet, they figured out all the mechanics of how to make it work. Um, this is back in dial-up internet. And, and what happened eventually is that when we moved from dial-up internet to high-speed access, DSL and cable and those kind of things, is that the technology wave and the industrialization wave was just simply too high of a hill to climb for poor little guys like me, all right? So this is when you started to see corporations come and start gobbling us up, all right? The third group are the extreme specialists who are looking for a real narrow niche and you fit in that niche. 
They, they have an expectation about the way things are supposed to shake out afterwards. And then the opposite are the extreme general generalists that own a little piece of everything. And so you're just that little piece of everything that they want to own. Now, the interesting thing about in the internet game, there was only one single coin of the realm that other ISPs cared about. And that was your subscriber base. They didn't care about your equipment. They didn't care about anything else, your offices, you name. They just wanted your subscriber base. And for them, each subscriber was worth about $200 each. <clears throat> so I had a subscriber base of about 1800 so the payoff there was about $350,000. And that was all that they cared about. And that's all that they wanted to buy. And so if you're going to survive the consolidation wave, this is what you've got to do. Now, what if you want to find your way out? What if you don't want to be consolidated? Well, one of the things that you might do is you might invest in fragmentation, take a small piece of the market and become an expert in that particular field. And so you might want to say, this is what Swedgelock and other the manufacturers of stainless steel fittings, it's a very narrow market that needs these stainless steel fittings but it's a highly expensive one too. If I'm a manufacturer and I don't want to be consolidated in, I can start my own brave new world by vertically integrating everything forward all the way through. And you might even say that's what Tesla did because they kind of sort of, they're, they're their own manufacturers. They're their own kind of wholesalers. They've, they've kind of built this whole direction. They've consolidated forward and they've vertic vertically integrated the supplies that they have as well, when it, especially when it comes to batteries. And I think somebody pointed it out and I was very impressed with that. They have what they, in the EV world, they are known as having the best software engineers in the world. So whoever, whatever group pointed that out, well done. <clears throat> Or you might increase your own attractiveness to the remaining channels by increasing your brand name, becoming strong enough so that you become one of the final survivors in that way as well. You can make your choice, go all in, give it everything you've got, and hopefully you can become a success. Now, the last thing I want to say about this chapter is the one thing that I talked about more than anything else was the most striking thing about wholesalers and retailers out there. They're large, but they're very seldom global. And that there is a lot of prevailing intelligence that says that wholesalers may never be global. And if you look at Moody Price, it kind of gives you an idea. Their situations and solutions are built around the entire southeastern United States and into the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know how well that would translate to, let's say, Indonesia with their oil situation or South America or, or any of the other major oil areas in the world. Wholesaling may never be truly global, but then again, that's okay. I mean, given the success of wholesaling, it also shows that they decided that they're going to plow the territory that they're the happiest with, all right? So one of the other things about wholesaling is, is that other than by e-commerce and B2B interchange, there's, I can't say that there's no impact that's going on with, with e-commerce at all. But if you're talking about its direct impact, 
wholesaling remains a physically dominant kind of business. They may make them more efficient. That might be true. But will they ever make them better? I'm, I'm just not sure of that. I, I don't know, all right? One last thing I want to put out is, is that there is a prevailing concern among wholesalers that the power retailers, the big guys, might bypass the wholesalers entirely and set up their own branches to perform their own channel functions. And certainly that's what we see with Walmart um, and to a lesser extent, perhaps, um, target, but certainly Walmart in the beginning, all right? But in the long run, I think that the number of power retailers out there are going to be very few, or they're going to have such specialized products like Tesla that I think they're not going to dominate and overrun the, the wholesale market, all right? <laughs> The one big thing, difficulty with that is that manufacturers have to respond to the dominant buyers and often at the expense of the wholesalers. And so what happens is, is that because the buyers are, have a more direct connection to the consumers, they sometimes get their foot in the door before the wholesalers do. And so that's it. I mean, wholesaling, it, we kind of gone through it very quickly but I urge you, if any of you are being, you know, um, interviewed by a wholesaler, let me know, because I'd be happy to help you if I could. Wholesaling is going to be a dominant force out there for years to come. And it's a very good, very successful job, one in which uh, employees are not being laid off. As a matter of fact, they're being increased. It's just a system that's getting better and better over Okay, folks, I will have a recording online on Wednesday. Turn in your position papers if you haven't on Thursday, just anytime during the day, and I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs> right, and I'm on oh, broccoli. Oh, yeah. yeah. No good deed ever goes on the phone. She's going, there. She's going down to SMA for a minute. So, yeah. So I get to take it too. Well, I told her, I ran to the restaurant. She has an optional review. I just started it. So, only about. So I didn't know. Well, I started my answer, but I always felt yeah. true. I turned out the front door, and I was tired. I was in India. I was back on my second. I'm not finished. Well, she didn't know. I'm sorry. You didn't either. <laughs> we'll get you to know. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.